Welcome back everybody to this series on end-to-end -end type safety where we've been building a full stack application using React, GraphQL, and Prisma. If you were around for the previous videos, you might know that we've built out our front-end application. We completely set up all the pieces we need to build a GraphQL API. And then finally, we built the actual GraphQL API. So all of those pieces are done and ready. Individually, they are completely type safe. So as individual projects, the front end is fully type safe and the API is fully type safe with the database as well. However, the two pieces are separate still. The types that interact between the two pieces are not quite in sync. So as we request data from our API, we can't be for certain right now that the data we get back is going to match the types that are front end has defined. So what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna actually set that up uh, using a tool called GraphQL CodeGen. That'll keep all of the types across our entire stack in sync. And it'll make use of that uh, source of truth, which is our Prisma schema. And then once we've set that up, our application will be complete and we will have set up a fully type safe uh, full stack application. So the final step that we'll do is actually get our code hosted on GitHub and then deploy it using render. So I'm really looking forward to wrapping this project up. It's been awesome to see all of these little pieces come together, and I think it'll be really cool to see the next pieces too. So let's go ahead and jump right into the project. To get started using GraphQL CodeGen, you first need to install a couple of dependencies. And so I'm gonna do that right now. Um, I'm over here in my terminal and I'm in my playgrounds folder and the directories that I created my projects in are within this folder. So I'm gonna CD into our React client. That's where I keep the front end code base. And this is where we're gonna set up GraphQL code gen because what's gonna happen is this will live in our front end code base. And when our GraphQL API is running, we'll set up a command that we can run to actually query that uh, API for its schema and generate types on our front end based off of that. So this is where we have to have the project live for now. And to get started, we're gonna first install GraphQL. So I'll do npm i GraphQL and we'll let that install. And then afterwards, there is another set of dependencies to install, and I'm gonna paste that and just sort of walk through what they are. So first of all, these are all gonna be de development dependencies. These will only run when we're in development mode. Um, so we do this dash D here. And then after that, we're installing a couple of plugins. So we've got the GraphQL CodeGen CLI. This is GraphQL CodeGen's main tool. This is what allows us to set up different plugins to set up these types that we're trying to generate. There's gonna be a bunch of different little pieces that we add into the CLI um, that help us generate different sets of types that we need for our specific application. So this is the main piece that allows us to set up those uh, plugins. And then afterwards we have all of our different plugins. So we're installing the typed document node, which is going to generate a type document node for us, which if you aren't familiar with what that is, this is gonna help us run an easy query for our GraphQL API data with um, type saved uh, requests and responses. And then after that, we are installing the GraphQL CodeGen TypeScript plugin, which helps us to generate these TypeScript types that we need. And then there is also this TypeScript operations plugin which is going to um, just help us also generate some more types. And I will dive into the actual types that get generated based off of our GraphQL API. So don't worry a whole lot about what, you, what each of these individual uh, packages do. Just worry about um, afterwards, once we actually use it, what the end result is of all of them. And if you're curious about what each of these specifically do, there is a blog post associated with this video. And in that blog post, I provide links and just general overviews of each uh, package. So feel free to pop that open and give these a read. But for now, I'll just install these packages and let that go. Cool. And there we go. So we have installed these packages and now what's left to do is actually configure these. So this gives you access to this set of tools that will generate these types for you, but they won't really do anything until you configure it. And the way you do that is you actually use a YAML file. So we're going to create a new file. So I'll do touch, and we're gonna create a file called codegen.yaml. And then with that created, I'll be ready to go ahead and pop my code base open. And we'll go ahead and open up that new file that we just created. And I'll get rid of some of this here. Awesome, so this is where we're gonna define all of the configuration that we need for 
setting up GraphQL CodeGen to actually read our GraphQL API schema and generate the types based off of it. And there's a bunch of different options that you can provide here, but we're gonna go over um, the sort of a minimal setup, but it'll do exactly what we need. So the first option that we're gonna provide is schema. So this is telling GraphQL CodeGen where to actually look for your GraphQL schema. That way it knows where to grab that from so that it can generate its types. And we have our, um, our GraphQL API running on localhost port 4000. So that's exactly what I'm gonna put here. I'll do HTTP localhost 4000, and then it's at the GraphQL endpoint. If you remember, this is how we actually um, open up our GraphQL playground is we went to localhost 4000 slash GraphQL. So once our GraphQL API is up and running, it currently isn't right now, but once we get it up and running, this is where we can actually go to see our GraphQL schema. The next piece that we're gonna add is documents. So what this is gonna do is this is going to look in our front end code base. So within our front end code base, we're actually gonna write queries for data from our GraphQL API, and we're gonna write those in GraphQL files or .gql files. And what those are gonna have is just GraphQL queries. And what this piece here is gonna do in our GraphQL um, codegen.yaml file is this is gonna look through all of those queries and determine which queries you're running, which mutations you're running maybe, and what the responses back should be because you get to specify which fields you want to query for. Um, this is gonna let codegen.yaml know what the responses back should be. And then it's going to use those to generate uh, types for what the responses from your query should be. So that's going to be super helpful for getting um, network request types back. So what we're going to add here is we're going to add a blob. So it's going to look in the source and then we're going to write all of our um, all of our queries within the source directory. So we'll do um, star star to let it know to look in any directory within the source folder. And then after that we're going to do star dot GraphQL. So it's basically saying, look in the source directory and within that directory, look for any GraphQL files and it's gonna scan through those. So this is really similar to when we set up tail in CSS so that we showed it how to look for any of the classes that we were using in our front end project, except this is now just looking for GraphQL files instead. So now that we've set that up, we need to add another key called generates. And this is where we're gonna actually configure what, uh, what GraphQL CodeGen should generate. So the goal of this is that it's gonna look at our schema, it's gonna look at our queries that we're running in our front end code base, and it's gonna generate some types for us to help make querying easier and to add that type safety based off of our Graph GraphQL schema. But we need a place to actually spit out the types that it generated for us. So let's do that. We're gonna spit them out in the source directory. We're gonna create a new folder called GraphQL and we're going to spit these generated types and objects out into a generated.ts file. That doesn't exist yet, but GraphQL code gen will actually generate that for us. And then we need to also tell GraphQL code gen that in order to generate that file, we're gonna use a couple of plugins and we're going to list here all of the ones that we installed. So we installed TypeScript, we installed TypeScript operations, and we also installed typed document, document node. So these are all the different plugins that we installed. And so this is what's gonna actually, uh, these plugins here are what are actually gonna be used to generate the proper outputs for us. And with those in place, we should now actually go into our package JSON. And I'm gonna add a new script here called CodeGen. And all this is gonna do is run GraphQL CodeGen. So this is just a, a way to run that command easily. Um, so we could just do npm run CodeGen and it will actually do that. So at this point, what we have um, is the setup all in place to actually run this, but this won't actually work unless we have a GraphQL API running and we have some queries uh, to search through for that GraphQL API. So what we're gonna have to do next is actually write a query. So if we go into our source directory, we're gonna write all of our queries in a GraphQL directory just to keep things organized. And plus we're already using that GraphQL name here, so we might as well uh, take more advantage of that. So let's create a GraphQL directory, new folder, GraphQL, 
And then within here, we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call this users.query.graphql. And so within here, this is where we're gonna write a query for all of our user data. Now this is gonna be the only query that our application needs because we only have uh, one sort of display and it's just a list of users and their messages. And if you think back to our GraphQL API, we can get all of that data from one query, which is the users query. So we're going to add a new query and we're gonna call it get users. And for this query, we're going to say we wanna run our users query and we wanna get just a specific set of data. We need to get our name for each user and then we need to get the messages for each user and for each message we want a body. So this is just a really simple query. It's using the users query that we wrote in our GraphQL API. Um, and if you weren't here for the previous video, definitely go back and take a look at that. That's where we set up the whole GraphQL API and where we actually built this query. Um, but this is going to query for that data and it's gonna return this set of fields. And now this is where GraphQL code gen is gonna come in and be very powerful. So when we actually run the code gen command with our GraphQL API running, it's gonna create an object for us called get users um, and then some string after that. And this object is gonna represent this query and it's going to be properly typed. So we're gonna be able to pass this into our uh, GraphQL API client uh, that's gonna actually query our GraphQL API. And it's going to uh, allow us to know which fields are available within our GraphQL API and which fields we're actually asking for and returning back. And that way in our front end application, we can use this nice type safe uh, API response. And we'll see more what that means in a second, but just know for now that this uh, is gonna be super useful for us uh, later on. So we've got our query written and now at this point, we're ready to actually generate our types, but before we do so, we need to actually run our GraphQL API that needs to be running before we uh, can generate our types. So I'm gonna go into the directory for that, and it's called GraphQL server, and I'll run npm run dev. And the reason this needs to be running is because I, as you can see here, once we ran it, the server started on port 4000, and in our code gen YAML, this is looking at localhost 4000 for uh, the GraphQL schema. If our GraphQL API wasn't running, it would have no way to actually know how to get this schema. So that's that. Now we can run our terminal in the front end project and run npm run code gen. And we're actually getting an error, but it looks like that's because I forgot a colon here. So we need to add this colon so that we know that these plugins are associated with that generated output. So I'll save that and npm run code gen again. And we get this, we get parse configuration, generate outputs. So it parsed our GraphQL schema and it generated our types for us. And we can actually see those if we pop open this GraphQL folder here. And as we specified over here, we now have a generated.ts file. So I'll open that guy up and I will close these down. And what we can see here is that we have a set of types and objects that represent our GraphQL schema. We have all of our scalers here. So we could see we actually have this uh, date here. It says any because by default, GraphQL doesn't support a date scaler, but we did add it in our GraphQL API. So that's in there. We have our message and this is taken straight from our API. This was not specified anywhere in our front end code. And then we also have our user. And then finally, what we get is also another set of types and objects that represent the query we wrote. So this get users document is actually going to be an abstract syntax tree representation of our query that we wrote. And this is what we're gonna use to actually pass into our GraphQL client API to query our GraphQL uh, database. And this is super cool because as you can see at the end, you don't necessarily need to know what this document node does, but just know that these types that are getting passed into it are going to help us within our application code actually uh, understand what type should be returned from this query. So this is going to be super helpful for us as we move on. And because we have all of this set up now, we can actually start putting things into place to use these types. So if you remember from the very first video of the series in our front end project, we um, created this file called types.ts. And this is where we defined all of our manually written types, and this is sort of what we based our data off of. 
But now that we have these generated types from our GraphQL API, we're gonna use those instead. So at the very top of this file, you're going to import a type. And this type is gonna come from GraphQL generated. Now, this is gonna have a bunch of different types for us that we can choose from. And if we look here, we have the uh, get users query type. And this is the one that we're actually gonna use. Uh, we do have user types and message types, but we're not gonna use those because these are gonna contain the entire user and message uh, document types. And that'll include fields like their ID, their created at, and we're not actually looking for those within our uh, query that we use to actually get this data, we leave those out and we only grab uh, certain fields. So we're going to use the query type instead so that our types are based off of the data that we're actually grabbing from the API. So here's what that'll look like. Um, for our message type, we're going to do the get users query. And we're going to go in here and we're going to look for the user's key that we get from that. And we'll grab the first one. And then within that user, we're going to look at the messages key and we'll grab the first one. And the reason that we're doing these uh, array uh, zero here is because our type doesn't really care um, how many records are in, the, uh, are in the data response. It just assumes that there will be one. And so it, this is how it nests its type. If you look at this, this has an array and this users is also an array. So we need to just go into the zero index of that so that we can pull out that type definition. And we're gonna do something really similar for our user object. Um, if I could copy this over. We're just gonna pull off this messages part because we don't need that. So now instead of getting the entire object that's available from our GraphQL API uh, representing users and messages, we're instead getting these really slimmed down types representing only the pieces of data that we're actually grabbing. Uh, if we had used just the plain user type, we might uh, grab a user from our API and then we'd expect to be able to access the ID field or the created at field. And when we went to access that in our front end code, we would, to our surprise, get an error because that data doesn't exist or it's undefined. And that's because we weren't actually querying for it. So one of the cool powerful things about using this GraphQL code gen library is that now we get these types that are based off of what we're actually querying. And that's gonna help us a lot. Um, and especially if you're working in a big application with maybe a big API, there's a lot of different places where you're querying for things. You might not always know, and it might not always be um, easy to find out uh, what you're querying for and what data should be expected where. So when you have a structure like this put in place, it's gonna uh, take care of all of that for you and your types will just work. So this is really cool. These are all the types that we're gonna need. If you remember back to the rest of the application, um, all of the typings are based off of the types in this file in types.ts. So everything should be using these now. The next thing that we actually need to set up is the library to query our GraphQL API so that we can actually grab data from it and make use of these types. And to do that, we're going to need to install a library. So if we open up our terminal, we can do npm install URQL. So we're using Urkel. This is a very popular uh, client to query a GraphQL API. And this it has a lot of good documentation around it. So we're going to use this one. I'll go ahead and install that guy. And then I'll close this down. And to actually use that, we need to instantiate a, uh, an instance of its client and then provide it to our application. And to do so, we're going to head to main.tsx and import a couple of things from its library. The first one's called create client and then provider. So what create client's gonna do is it's gonna allow us to instantiate the, uh, the client and sort of configure it to look for our GraphQL API. And then the, the provider is just the, uh, the provider to give it to our application. So let's create an instance of the client. We'll just call this client. It's gonna equal create client and it's gonna have a configuration object. And we only care about one of the items in here and that's called URL. So this piece is going to tell um, Urkel where to look for our GraphQL API so it knows where to actually send its requests to. And where our API lives currently is HTTP localhost 4000 slash GraphQL. 
But there's a problem with this. This isn't always where our API is gonna be. This is just where it is in development mode. Once we actually deploy our API, it's gonna be at some different URL that's publicly available. So we're gonna to need to use a environment variable to find uh, where the API can be. And if an environment variable with an API URL doesn't exist, then we'll fall back to this localhost 4000 and just assume we're in development mode. And in Vite, there's actually a special way to do this. You go to imports dot meta dot env and then within here you can go api url and I'll actually do v api url so we're going to say that this is v url for that and i think this wasn't imports this is import there we go so it's not plural it's a singular there so we need to look at uh, import dot meta dot env dot v api url and this is going to have the URL of some GraphQL API, hopefully. And if it doesn't, then we're gonna say, all right, we must be in development mode, use this URL. So that's the only setup we need for our client. The next piece is to actually provide it to our application. So we'll use this provider and we'll wrap our app in that provider. And this provider is gonna take in a value of our client. So there we go, this is all configured. We have Urkel configured to actually use this client and we can head over now to our app.tsx. This is where we're gonna actually run our query and we can run it. And to do so, we're gonna to have to import a couple things again. The very first one is a function called useQuery and this is from Urkel. And we had to provide Urkel to our application so that we could actually use this function properly. And the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna import the git users document. And this is gonna be from GraphQL generated. And what this document is, is that uh, representation of our query that we wrote. And so it's gonna give us that nice typing when we get our response back from our GraphQL API. So this mock data that we have down here, this can now go away because we're gonna be grabbing the data from our API instead. And instead we're going to uh, set up a new constant. And then this constant is going to be called results and it's going to be use query. And this use query function will take in a query key. And what we can pass this is our get users document. You can also write your, uh, your GraphQL query manually, but because we have this document representation with the properly typed results, that's what we're gonna use. Now, um, the data that we get back from this does come back as an array with a couple of different indexes. And what we want is the zeroth index. The first index of that array is gonna uh, contain our results. Now, here's where we get to see what's actually really cool about this. Now that we have um, this get users document being used as our query, we can get rid of this user type that's up at the top because we won't need that. And if we look through our results, we can see that we have a set of data here and we're going to go into that data. And right here we have a user's key within the data. So we didn't set up any type on our front end manually to represent what this API request is returning. This was generated by GraphQL code gen. If we go into the users, uh, users, and we look at the first index of that, we can see that it knows that we're gonna be getting back uh, an array of messages and a name. And then if we go into the messages, look at the first one there, it's gonna know that we're pulling back just the body. So this is how we get that nice type safety uh, from our API requests. As we query our data, um, a lot of times the disconnect between your front end and the back end uh, lies with this actual piece where you query your data from your API. You don't really, you can't be certain that your API is gonna return what your front end is expecting. But because of GraphQL code gen and because GraphQL allows you to sort of do this with its schema, we can now actually be positive that we're getting the responses back that we expect in our front end, and we get them in a nice type safe way so that our, um, we can set up these rules within our code to follow that. Um, so now that we have that in place, let's replace our map down here with results.data.users. And as you can see, our nicely typed uh, components are not complaining at all because this user here is expecting the user type and this is gonna be the type generated by GraphQL code gen. And that's exactly what we're passing in. 
because we use this get user document uh, that returns the proper type. So our whole front end application is in sync type wise now. And this is the kicker right here is this whole front end applications types that are in sync are also in sync with our GraphQL API. And the GraphQL API, its types are in sync with our database schema. So at this point, we've actually achieved full end to end type safety. Um, our types on our front end are actually being completely driven by the types in our database, which falls down to the types in our, uh, our database client, which is Prisma. And that gets used to generate the types in our GraphQL schema uh, through Pothos. And then GraphQL code gen, of course, generates our TypeScript types for the front end based off of our GraphQL schema. So this whole suite of tools that we've put together allows us to be completely type safe. So if we actually run our project now, I'll open up a new terminal, run npm run dev. And if we head to our local host, we should now see that we have all of our users being displayed. So this is all straight from our database in Railway. We have all three users at this point, not just our single mock user. So we can be sure that these are all uh, being pulled directly from the database. And with that, that actually completes our application. We've now built our full front-end application. We've built our full GraphQL API, and then we've connected the two. And all of those pieces are fully in sync in their types. And that means we have completely achieved end-to-end -end type safety. So that's the main goal of this series. But there is one last little piece that we want to do. This is currently just running locally, but what we want to do is actually expose this so that we can host it and deploy it so that other people can use it. So that's what we're going to do next. To actually deploy these, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get both of the projects, the front end code base and the back end code base, onto GitHub. So we're going to have to publish them to GitHub. And then we're going to use a service called Render to actually deploy the applications. And that's how we're going to deploy them. And we should be able to then connect the two and see the data and see it all working just how it does locally, except it will be publicly available. But the first step in all this is to actually uh, get these projects on GitHub. So to do that, head over to GitHub. And if you don't have an account already, please do go ahead and create an account. Uh, you'll need one to create new repositories. Um, I already have some repositories, so I'm just gonna find this new button here. You should be able to find this as well once you've logged in and I'll hit new. And the first one that I'm gonna do is I'll do our front end code base. So I'll do E2E type safety front end. And you can name this whatever you want. This is just the name that I'm choosing. Uh, but once you've done that, you can hit create repository and this will create your repository for you. And you're gonna be spit out on this page uh, for your repository with uh, a couple of different pieces of information. The one that we care about is this URL here. We wanna copy this guy, which you can do by just clicking this button. And that's what we're gonna to use to actually initialize uh, Git within our code and get this connected to GitHub. So let's go back to the code now and I'll expand this terminal window and I'll just go ahead and shut the development server down for now. But we're gonna have to run a couple of commands. So the first one is git init and this initializes git in your project and then we need to actually stage all of the changes that we made. So at this point, that would be everything that we've done so far. So I'll do git add dot and that just tells git to stage everything and then we want to commit these changes. So we'll do git commit dash n so we can add a message and we'll just say first commit. You could probably be more specific, but for now I think that'll do what we need it to. So you can see there it's committed everything that we've changed and now we need to actually branch this off and push it. So we're gonna do git branch dash m and we'll call this main. And then finally, we need to add a remote. So this is how we're gonna actually connect our code base here to the code base on GitHub. So we'll do git remote add origin so that we can add a new origin. And then we're gonna paste in that URL that you copied and we're gonna paste that in here. So we've now added this origin and we can push our code changes to that origin. So what we're gonna do is git push dash u and we're gonna do origin main. So we're pushing this to a main branch at the origin. 
And there we go. So this pushed our code changes up. And if we actually head back to GitHub and if we refresh the page, we should see that our code is now available on GitHub. So that was the front end project. Now we need to do the back end. So if you head back to, um, let's go back to repositories, you can hit the new button up here. And we'll just do pretty much the same steps. We'll do E2E type safety and I'll do API this time and I'll hit create. And from here, you can copy over your string again. And this time we need to go into our GraphQL servers code base. So pop that open however you like. And you should see that uh, come up. Once again, I'll expand this and we'll go through the same exact steps as before. We're gonna do git init, git add dot, git commit dash m, first commit. And then we need to set up our branch. So git branch dash m main, and we will add our origin, git remote origin. Oh, actually git remote add origin. I paste that origin there and then push the code. So git push dash u origin main. So there we go. I went through that a little bit quickly. Uh, feel free to go back and uh, maybe slow it down if you want, but that is the same exact steps we went through to deploy the, uh, the, the front end to GitHub. So if we refresh this page, we should see that our API code is now available on GitHub as well. So that's how we get it all on GitHub. The last piece is gonna be deploying this using render. So in order to actually deploy this code, uh, head over to render.com. And once you've created an account and signed in, you should be on a page that looks something like this. If you have already used render before and you already have projects, it might be a little bit different. So uh, the steps might be a little different and I'll explain what those are here. Um, the very first thing that we're going to deploy is our GraphQL API because we are going to need that API URL before we deploy our front end. So we need to do this one first. And to do that with render, what you need to deploy is a web service. So this is the option you'd select here. If you already have projects in render, I don't think you'll actually see um, the selection of options. So what you can do instead is hit uh, this new button and web service. But I'll click this guy. And what you're gonna need to do is actually connect your GitHub account. Now that you've hosted your code on GitHub, um, you can connect your account to render and then it should show all of your available uh, repositories. So the way you do that is over here on the right side, there's gonna be a button to connect your account. I've already done that and you can see it's connected here. Um, so like I said, the first thing that we're going to uh, deploy is our API. So if you hit connect, this should set up your uh, your deployment so that you can start configuring it and getting it ready to go. So if you go to the name, we're just gonna call this GraphQL API, and we want our environment to be node. I'll bump the size here a little bit. And then we can leave some of this the same. Uh, Oregon West is fine for me. Feel free to configure this however you want. Our branch is called main, so we'll leave it there. Our build command's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, I think in the blog post, we actually do create a build command within our code base itself. And this build command just installs your NPM packages and generates the Prisma client. But for the purposes of this video, we're just gonna do that right here. We're gonna do npm i to do npm install, and then npx Prisma generate. And this is gonna generate Prisma client for you. And um, that way, within your deployed server, it'll actually know how to connect to your database. So that's gonna be an important piece right here. Uh, the start command is gonna be npm run dev. This is how we run our development server. And then the final piece is going to be adding your environment variables. Uh, because we are using Prisma, it uses an environment variable called database URL, uh, and that is gonna hold your, uh, your connection string. So we need to add this database URL environment variable here and then head to uh, your backend code base. And in the .env, you'll see this database URL variable. You're gonna have to grab that connection string out of there. And alternatively, you could grab this directly from Railway. That's an option too, just wherever you uh, find it easiest to get. 
So once that's configured, you can actually hit create web service and this is going to deploy your service for you and uh, get it up and running. So I'll hit that. And what you're gonna see after you hit this, once this page changes, is you're gonna see a set of logs. This is gonna be the steps that render's taking to actually deploy your application. So I'm gonna pause the video uh, and once this has finished up, I will come back. All right, so that's finished up deploying for me. So what you're left with is this page where you get to see all the log output. If you uh, scroll up a bit, maybe it might be near the bottom. Uh, you'll see your yoga server did start running and our output with the rocket here says that it started on port 4000. So that's great. Um, if we go up to the very top of this page, you're gonna see this URL with a copy button. So hit that button and paste that into your browser and then go to the GraphQL endpoint. So what you're gonna see here is the same GraphQL yoga playground that you saw before, except this time it is live. It's public for uh, anyone to access. And if you actually go in here and query some data, you're gonna get your data back. So this is the API deployed. And now the last piece is to deploy the front end project. So head back to render and go to your dashboard and you're gonna hit new. And this time, instead of a web service, you're gonna do a static site. And the steps are gonna be very similar here. You're gonna connect your front end project. So this time we're gonna select our front end right here. Hit connect. And then I'll call this, um, I'll just call it E2E front end. And again, the branch is gonna be called main. And because we used Vite, it came with a pre-built build command for us. So we can actually run npm run build here. And the published directory here should be dist. This is just the directory that Vite uses when it actually runs its build. It generates its assets into a folder called dist. Uh, so with that in place though, what we need to do next is go into our advanced, add an environment variable. And then if you remember, we had to set up a, uh, an environment variable for our front end project that contains the location of our deployed uh, GraphQL API, otherwise it'll fall back to localhost 4000, which in this case won't exist. So what we're gonna make this is the URL of our GraphQL API here. So I'm gonna copy that. And we called this Vite API URL, and I'll paste this in. This is just the URL that we copied. Um, the one that you copy from render is just this piece here and we added this slash GraphQL, so make sure that the, both of those pieces are available. And then with that in place, you should be ready to deploy this site. So go ahead and create static site. This one should go quite a bit quicker because it is using Vite. Um, so I will pause the video again and come back once it's done. Okay, so that finished deploying. It says your site is live, so let's go ahead and test it. In the same location that we got the GraphQL API URL, you're gonna see this URL here. You can just copy that over and you're gonna paste it over here. And what you see when that page loads up is gonna be your completely deployed application. So the page here that we're seeing is actually our front-end project deployed uh, via render, and it's accessing our GraphQL API, which is also deployed on render, so none of this is running locally. And then finally, it's accessing all of our data from our Postgres database. So this application is complete. You've completely set up a end-to-end -end type safe application and deployed it. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for following me along with the past four videos. It was super fun to be able to set up this full application and see all these nice little pieces come together so that we have a completely end-to-end -end type safe application. If you have any questions or if you have any concerns maybe about anything that was going on in these videos and you need some answers, please feel free to reach out to me directly on Twitter or reach out to anybody on the Prisma team. We would be happy to help you and try to explain what we can. Um, you can find our contact information on uh, our Prisma website and I'll be sure to have some contact information on the description of this video as well if you wanna reach out. But again, thank you so much for watching and I hope this helped.